Good morning and thank you for joining us for our session on the distribution of the safety net. Kicking things off is Dr. Gwen Pauley of the University of Wisconsin with her presentation on trends in the distribution of social safety net support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll just mention that um, this is joint work with Carolina Cardona and Robert Moffitt who are both at Johns Hopkins. Uh, yeah, so you can go to the next one. So, um, I imagine that most of the people here, uh, think that the social safety net in the U S is probably worthy of studying and further that the SIP is the, um, right data set to do so. But just to put a little bit of context in it in 2018, the U S spent a little bit over 1 trillion dollars in the, on the largest means tested safety net programs. I'll show you a picture of this, but over the past 50 years, real expenditure per capita on both means tested and social insurance programs have grown enormously. And we've seen that medical programs, specifically Medicare and Medicaid, have had the largest growth. But what we're going to do is kind of take a step back from the aggregate trends and look at the distribution of benefits. So we think about the distribution as important and interesting um, because it's a measure of inequality that reflects government policy decisions. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so just a, a brief history or a brief overview of what is a large literature. Um, in the 20 years between 1984 and 2004, the lowest income families had declining real support while higher income families received increasing support. Um, this decrease was largely due to a uh, contraction of AFDC, while the increase was um, predominantly due to an increase in the earned income tax credit. During this phase, older individuals and those with disabilities had greater real growth than the non-aged and those without disabilities. And this work led to the coining of the term, the deserving poor, which is just the idea that um, individuals and families who are able to and choose to work are more deserving of uh, the social safety net than those who aren't. And so you kind of see that in the earned income tax credit. During the Great Recession, um, this trend was reversed and we saw that more support actually went to the poorest households. So if you remember back in 2008 to 2010, there was a large increase in um, SNAP and TANF. And then after the Great Recession, we saw um, this trend reverse again and families with higher incomes had larger increases in support than those with um, the lowest amount of income. And so here, the widening of that gap was actually um, an increase in inequality in the social safety net. Next slide. More recently, and you'll note here that we're only thinking about pre-COVID, so maybe next year you come back and hear about COVID, but um, pre-COVID, the two major trends, or sorry, two major changes in the safety net that I'd like to highlight were the expansion of Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act and the expansion of the child tax credit as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So these two programs um, are going to target different types of people or different types of families. So we can think about the expansion of Medicaid as um, me meaning that Medicaid was more widely available to childless adults as well as higher earners. Historically, Medicaid has really been concentrated on the poorest of the poor families. While the child tax credit obviously affected children with families more, as well as higher earning families. Next slide. So um, here I'd like to just show you a couple graphs looking at expenditures per capita. And on the um, X axis, you can see that we're starting in 1970 and going through 2019. And um, the red line, the one on top, is all of the 17 largest programs. And so you can see just enormous growth over the past 50 years. And then um, you can see a little blip around 2018. That's the expansion of the social safety net during the Great Recession. 
After the Great Recession, we saw a fall off in the social safety net, but that drop was not as large as the increase that um, came before it. So even after the Great Recession, um, annual expenditures per capita were higher than they were prior to the recession. If you break it down, instead of looking at all programs and look at social insurance and mean tested separately, so here we're looking at the black dotted line as social insurance and then the green solid line as means tested programs, you can see that they've largely followed the same trend. However, if you take Medicaid out of the um, means tested programs, and so here we're looking at the blue dotted line on the bottom, what you can see is that that increase in means tested programs was really driven by an increase in Medicaid during this time period. And in fact, by 1998, about half or more of the means tested expenditures were because of Medicaid. Um, so I'm gonna show you two more pictures which will kind of highlight what is driving these increases. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, this, this very busy graph is showing expenditures per capita just for means tested programs. And so I'd like to just highlight a few things that have been happening over time. Um, the first is that if you can find the purple solid line, you'll see that it's decreased um, starting after 1996. So starting after welfare reform, that line is expenditures per capita for AFDC and TANF. And so you've, you've seen a remarkable decrease in that over time. That's kind of gone hand in hand with increases in other programs. So the green solid line is the earned income tax credit. And you can see that dramatic increase during the 1990s. And the um, yellow solid line is food stamps. And so you can see a large increase during the Great Recession followed by a decrease, but still that decrease didn't cut out the entire increase before the or during the Great Recession. And then the last program that I'd like to highlight here is in the red dotted line, and that's the child tax credit. And so I kind of mentioned the expansion of the child tax credit um, in 2017. And so you can see expenditures per capita in that just really remarkably increasing. Next slide. So this is a similar graph, but instead of looking at means tested, this is just looking at social insurance programs. And so what I'd like to highlight here is just that the increase in social insurance programs that we saw over time is largely driven by um, social security as well as Medicare. And those two programs really dwarf any of the other social insurance programs. So they're um, remarkably higher than disability insurance, workers' comp, or unemployment. Next slide. So um, this paper really has two kind of agendas. The first is to update past work through 2019, so right before the um, pandemic. And then the second agenda is to add in Medicaid, which often goes to the poorest of families and has changed a lot in who is eligible uh, in the past decade. Um, we're gonna to aim to answer three main questions. Which families in the United States received the most support? And we'll be thinking about family types as well as income bins here. Um, have the patterns of recipiency changed over time? And then what role does Medicaid play? Next slide. So we're going to draw on two main data sources. Uh, the first is the Survey of Income and Program Participation, the SIP. Um, and we're going to use panels from 1996 to 2020 to measure receipt between 1998 and 2019. So for earlier years, we kind of have select years, and then more recently, we have every year from 20, uh, sorry, 2008 through 2019. From the SIP, we'll take um, receipt and average benefit amounts for 11 transfer programs over four months of the calendar year. So here, we're going to think specifically about AFDC and TANF, disability insurance, SNAP or food stamps, foster kids, housing assistance, OASDI, SSI, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation, and WIC. And those are all going to come directly from the SIP. 
Um, and then for the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit, we're going to calculate receipt and amount of those based on NBER's tax sim. And we'll do corrections for underreporting, which I'll, I'll talk briefly about to try to match each of these to administrative control totals. Next slide. Um, you might notice that we didn't talk about Medicaid at all, and that's because Medicaid expenditures aren't actually reported in the SIP. So we're going to pair information about program receipt with information about Medicaid expenditures from the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey, or MEPS. Um, and MEPS is kind of nice because they survey providers about how much they received from Medicaid. So we have um, hopefully accurate uh, Medicaid expenditures on a person level. And um, we're going to do similar to the other programs. We um, impute recipiency and benefit amounts to administrative totals. We're going to do that for children and adults separately. Um, and this is particularly important because of who the Medicaid expansion is targeted. And then we are going to aggregate everything to the family level to try to match as best as we can SIP definitions. Next slide. Um, this project focuses on non-elderly, non-disabled families, and that's really going to be to eliminate the influence of retirement and disability programs that I highlighted earlier. And then within non-elderly, non-disabled families, we're going to divide them into three types based on the number of children and parents in the household. So we'll think about single parent, two parent, and childless families separately. And this is going to be all based on the last reference month that we observe a family. So we're not doing anything, for example, with uh, transitions here. This is just a point in time what your family type was like. So um, we take the four calendar months and then we average over those four months and multiply by 12 to get an annual total. And then based on those annual totals, we impute recipiency and amounts. And we do this in three general steps. Um, for each program separately, we first impute recipients to match administrative totals. And then of those who we imputed, we impute benefit amounts. And then the last step is to ratio all amounts to match administrative totals. Um, I'll just mention that this is something we plan on working on in the near future to try to jointly impute programs, but right now we're just doing each program separately. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, here is our kind of main findings broken down by family type, not by income yet. Um, so the first thing that I'd like to show is that as you might expect, Families with children receive more expenditures on average than those without. So the red line is single parent families, the blue line is two parent families, and then the gray line is childless families. And you can see that they kind of stack up nicely over time. The other thing that I'd like to highlight is that prior to 2017, there really wasn't a lot of change in trends. However, after that expansion of the child tax credit, you can see a widening gap between families with children and families without. Next slide, please. Okay, and then um, here is family type and income shown separately. And I have these, so you might actually be able to see them, but I just want to point out the same patterns still hold, even when you break it down by income, where single parent families on average receive more than two parent families who receive more than childless families. So the next three slides will show these separately. So if you can advance to the single parent family. Okay, so um, here is, sing this is just for single parent families. And then the um, families are broken down by their pre-tax, pre-transfer income. And so here, the red bin is families who earn between zero and 50% of the federal poverty line. And then um, it advances by 50%. So the light blue um, histogram, or sorry, bar is those who earned between 50 and 100%, and then 100 to 150 and 150 to 200% of the poverty line, federal poverty line. 
So what you can see here is that starting in 1998, we really saw a pretty clear gradient between um, expenditures and um, family income, where those with lower family incomes received more benefits. However, by 2016, this gradient was distorted and we saw that families um, in what we call shallow poverty between 50 and 100% of the federal poverty line actually received more in benefits than those families in deep poverty between zero and 50% of the poverty line. Um, this happened uh, kind of because of a variety of, of programs, which you might expect, but I'll just highlight a few of them. For families in deep poverty, they experienced a decrease in TANF benefits, as well as a decrease in housing expenditures per capita, which is largely due to a fixed supply of housing. On the other hand, families in um, shallow poverty had an increase in their uh, EITC and the child tax credit. SNAP grew for all families, but it was actually larger for the highest income or higher income families due to an increase in income eligibility. And then we kind of talked about Medicaid being concentrated on lower income families. And that is true that the poorest of the families received more Medicaid, but it wasn't enough to kind of offset the um, increases that families that, sorry, families in shallow poverty received that those in deep poverty did not. So next slide, please. Okay, so this is very similar graph, but here we're focusing on two parent families. And the main thing I'd like to point out is that in 1998, that income expenditure gradient is very clear, but the reversal happens even earlier for two parent families. Um, two parent and single parent families kind of have different program receipt patterns. And so, for example, as you might expect, two parent families are more likely to receive the child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, and unemployment insurance, um, probably because there's two adults that could be working rather than one. But the inversion that happened is largely due to the same patterns of single family. Um, single parent families. Um, and then next slide. Childless families, again, they receive far uh, fewer benefits than families with children. And you can see that this inversion didn't actually happen for childless families. So the income um, to expenditures gradient is very clear for every year shown here. So from 1998 through 2019. Last slide, please. Okay. So, um, just to summarize, the US safety net has increasingly provided support for families with higher levels of earnings and income. And I think you've kind of seen that um, in that we've documented that flip in um, families between zero and 50 and 50 and 100% of the poverty line. Um, uh, this long-term trend has been punctuated with greater support to the poorest families during recessions, um, but the trend towards greater support for working families reflects continued favored treatment by policymakers. So this is, again, going back to that idea of the deserving poor. Future work will consider how the expansion of programs, especially SNAP, Medicaid, and uninsurance employment during the pandemic affected these trends. Thanks. Unmute, Veronica. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Han Shang Ren, a PhD student at Stanford University. He is interested in the sociology of knowledge, sociology of education, sociology of science and technology, and sociological research methods. It is his interest in studying the formation and exercise of moral knowledge that drove him to study the U.S. charity sector. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Um, this is all very much um, working progress, so please be gentle on me. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm going to talk about、uh, the relationship between race, ethnicity, and、um, the receipt of charitable aid.、Um, can we go to the next slide, please?、Um, yeah, so I'm just going to start with some background information about、uh, why I'm interested in this topic,、um, and then I'm going to talk about、um, sort of the、uh, racial and ethnic differences、um, in the level of charity receipt,、um, and then the next two se sections will. Um, explore、uh, sort of the potential reasons、uh, why different racial and ethnic groups、uh, might receive、uh, might have different likelihoods of、um, charity receipt.、Um, next slide, please.、Um, yeah. Um, so the big picture of the situation is that、uh, American charities have a lot of money.、Um, Total charitable giving by U.S. individuals, corporations, and foundations、uh, has roughly doubled since 1996,、uh, and this number appears to continue to rise,、um, and、um, uh, has reached、uh, 471.44 billion in 2020.、Uh, and actually, these only count the、uh, the private donations,、uh, which really accounts for only roughly 13 percent of the foundings for American charities. Uh, so, 87 percent of the funding actually comes from the government and、um, commercial sales. So,、um, the actual amount of money that goes through these charities or nonprofits、uh, might be closer to、uh, 3.5 trillion dollars,、uh, and、um, that is larger than the GDP of the United Kingdom. Um, yeah, um, and、um, the growth in the charity and nonprofit sector. Uh, reflects an outsourcing of social services and social welfare from the government,、um, especially after the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act of 1996,、uh, which sort of ended welfare as we know it.、Uh, and there's this idea that if we outsource it to private charities and nonprofits,、uh, this will、uh, further promote the allocative efficiency of free competition. Uh, and policymakers have expected、uh, these private enterprises to surpass the government、uh, in terms of its efficiency,、uh, flexibility, innovation, and daringness、uh, when serving society.、Um, so I'm interested in the extent to which this is actually happening.、Um, is the money helping communities that are most in need,、uh, or could the money be reinforcing the social stratification?、Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah.、Uh, so there are some reasons to expect that、um, instead of mending、um, social gaps,、um, charities might actually perpetuate、um, inequalities. Um, so uh, many sociologists are quite、um, skeptical about the role of charities um, in um, in society.、Um, many of them believe that charities serve the donors' interests、uh, by creating a respected image of the philanthropists、uh, in order to legitimize their wealth.、Um, and、um, if we look at the actual things that these charities are doing,、uh, we'll notice that around the 1970s and 1980s,、uh, the American charity sector started to、uh, pivot from poverty alleviation. To a broader range of human development initiatives,、uh, increasingly serving the non-poor.、Um, so perhaps instead of soup kitchens,、uh, you know, increasingly see like charities serving art museums and other、uh, facilities catering to richer populations.、Um, in 2005, only about、um, 31 percent of all donations、uh, explicitly targeted low-income communities,、uh, according to a study by the Center on Philanthropy in 2007.、Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and、um, given the history of racial inequalities in the United States,、uh, we might also expect inequalities in the charity sector、uh, to have a racial dimension.、Um, so donors and funding distributors may have inherited from the era of slavery、uh, a prejudice that cast black people as morally dubious、uh, individuals with poor work ethics. Um, who might be considered as responsible for their own economic hardship、uh, and therefore undeserving of aid,、um, and in addition to this kind of outright subjective prejudice,、uh, sometimes、uh, race can operate through um, um, so-called colorblind racism.、Um, so perhaps、um, racism in the past、uh, will cause um, particular um, charities. Um, serving particular um, um, ethnic or racial groups to be more powerful, to be better at fundraising.、Um, so、um, it might create a situation 
uh, where uh, nobody is actively um, perpetuating discrimination, uh, but nonetheless, you might see a, um, um, a racial disparity in charity receipt. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, yeah, but on the other hand, there are also many reasons to expect that uh, charities will not perpetuate social inequalities. Um, so, um, scholars have found through interviews that low income urban women um, find getting help from charities humiliating, uh, and they would not help seek help from these charities uh, unless all other options of relief are exhausted. Uh, and this to me suggests that charitable aid uh, may be actually reserved for the most desperate um, and the most disadvantaged. Um, and um, disadvantages of marginalized communities have also motivated activists, donors, uh, and funding allocators to provide targeted support. Uh, and this can potentially compensate uh, for the effects of structural racism. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we're left with an empirical question. Um, has the charity sector perpetuated economic inequalities between racial and ethnic groups by failing to ensure that charitable fundings will be directed to the most disadvantaged communities? Um, yeah, um, next slide, please. Yeah, so we'll now just uh, begin by looking at some basic statistics of uh, which ratio and ethnic groups are uh, most likely to get charitable help. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I looked at um, people who are in the first wave of the uh, 2014, 2018, 19, and 2020 panels of the ISS, SIPP. Uh, I specifically um, restricted the data to people with household income to poverty ratios um, below two um, um, because uh, we only have charity data uh, for those people. Uh, and um, for the same reason, I restricted data to people over 14. Um, and um, in the end, after uh, accounting for missing data, uh, we're left with roughly um, 32, 33,000 um, people. Um, yeah. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah. And in terms of how I operationalize the notion of charity receipt, um, each year, uh, respondents are asked three questions, uh, respectively, on whether they received clothing assistance, food assistance in the form of money, vouchers, or certificates, uh, or any money or income from a community or religious charity. Um, and um, in a separate question, uh, the respondents were asked whether they received any meals from a shelter, soup kitchen, uh, meals on wheels, or other charity. Um, and I constructed a binary variable that takes a positive value uh, as long as there's a positive answer um, to any of these four questions. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we're just going to look at, um, given a certain race or ethnicity, uh, what is the likelihood of uh, charity receipt? Um, and um, I also try to control for both race and ethnicity, as well as um, uh, the beneficiary's uh, asset to poverty ratio um, in his or her um, household. Uh, this is the part that I am still working on. Uh, I'm using um, a gener uh, general additive model uh, to sort of consider the long linear, the, the long linear relationship uh, between the asset to poverty ratio and um, the log likelihood uh, of getting um, um, getting charitable help. Uh, but I haven't really been able to get the sampling weights to work uh, for general additive models. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you some um, 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 some error bars, um, but like don't believe in those error bars, but the mean values should, should still be correct. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, you can actually believe in the error bars here. It, uh, it's just, uh, um, I'm, I'm just taking the mean of the different groups. Um, so we can see that um, some of the smallest ratio and ethnic groups have very large error bars. But for larger groups, uh, we see that the typical low income white and black individual uh, have roughly the same likelihood of receiving charity. Um, Hispanics are less likely to receive charitable help. Uh, and this is even less so for Asian Americans. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so I um, uh, so accounting for the household income to poverty ratio, uh, we also see racial disparities um, in charity receipt. 
uh, white people get the most travel help, uh, um, African Americans come second, uh, and then uh, there's the Hispanics and um, Asian Americans. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, so then I start to explore uh, potential reasons uh, for the ratio and ethnic gaps that we observe. Um, so, um, um, in terms of disparities as a result of outright subjective discrimination, uh, I have found four experiments uh, that randomly assign donors. Um, sorry, actually, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, uh, there are four experiments uh, that randomly assign donors uh, with images or videos of black or white beneficiaries um, to see if donors would um, um, give different amounts of money um, as charitable help. Uh, what these studies all share is that their samples all contain uh, non-Hispanic white donors, uh, and these samples are either already nationally representative uh, or could be reweighted to be roughly um, nationally representative. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these studies cover different cause areas, um, but in a sense, um, they're still all about um, the, um, the provision of basic life necessities um, to people in need. Um, next slide, please. So individually, um, none of these studies found a statistically significant effect, um, but the error bars are somewhat large. So I pulled these studies uh, using uh, replication data uh, when you can find uh, that replication data. Uh, and um, uh, there is one study for which replication data is not available. Uh, and I used inverse variance weighting uh, to combine it with uh, the results I'm getting from the other experiments. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, here I'm presenting just the pulled results for the three studies for which I have replication data um, because the inverse variance weighting uh, does not really change things by much. Um, so we can see that after pulling the data, uh, it still doesn't seem that there is a statistically significant race effect. Uh, we also see no statistically significant effect um, for different income groups. Um, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, uh, so this basically just says that for donors of different income groups, uh, we also don't see a statistically significant uh, race effect. Uh, and But it does seem that as the donors get richer, uh, they're likely to uh, donate a larger percentage uh, of the money that they're given um, within the experiments. Um, yeah, um, so um, one, one could argue that the, uh, the error bars are still quite wide here. Um, so we could definitely use um, more data points and do more experiments. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, uh, yeah, I would also uh, be interested in more studies uh, on donors of different social backgrounds. Um, and um, I'm, uh, also, we, we might need studies not just on um, how much people donate, but also on whether funding distributors' decisions um, are um, changed by potential racial bias. Uh, I would also be interested in studying other kinds of racial prejudice, so not just uh, racism between white and black people. Uh, we might also want to in include uh, Asian Americans and um, Hispanic Americans because they seem to be receiving even less uh, charitable help. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, um, so um, for Asian Americans and Hispanic Americans, um, there are two groups with a particularly large immigrant population. Um, so I explored a little bit uh, whether immigration uh, is related to um, charity receipt. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, uh, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, so uh, while we do not see a statistically significant difference between immigrants um, and non-immigrants for Asian and Hispanic Americans, uh, we do see a difference for white and black Americans uh, where um, uh, immigrants are less likely to uh, get charitable help. Uh, but we should um, take these results with a grain of salt, um, especially for black Americans, uh, as black immigrants tend to be richer 
um, than non-immigrants. So that might be an obvious reason uh, why uh, they receive less charitable, uh, uh, why they receive less charitable help. Um, and um, yeah, next slide, please. So I further examined how some immigration related factors um, might have a correlation with charity receipt. So I had expected to see that non-citizens uh, might have um, a, um, less charity receipt um, because they might contain a, a larger number of undocumented immigrants uh, who may be afraid of um, reaching out for help because they might get deported if uh, their identity gets discovered. Uh, but I didn't really see any statistically significant effect here. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I also expected to see that um, higher levels of cultural congruence um, may be related to greater charity receipt. Um, and here I did find that among Hispanics, um, people who speak a non-English language at home um, are less likely to get charitable help. Um, and this is true for both immigrants um, and non-immigrants. Uh, um, next slide, please. Yeah, so in summary, um, um, less affluent races and ethnicities are not always more likely to obtain charitable aid. Um, I find little evidence that racial prejudice can explain racial and ethnic gaps in charity receipt. Uh, but I cannot rule out the possibility that racial prejudice may indeed play an important role. Um, and thirdly, uh, discrimination based directly on racial categories involved in this research um, cannot explain all of the variations uh, in charity receipt. Um, and um, within racial and ethnic groups, uh, lower charity receipt is related to immigration um, and to incongruence between the donor's own culture um, and the mainstream U.S. culture. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move along uh, and I'll introduce you to our third presenter. Dr. Brian Stewart from the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. Great. Thanks very much, Veronica. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here uh, talking about work that is joint with Ilira Kuka at George Washington University. Uh, the views here are my own. Uh, next slide, please. So for individuals that lose their job, public unemployment insurance is the most important buffer against the lost income that they face. Uh, and an important feature of unemployment insurance or UI in the United States is that this is not an automatically provided program. Uh, instead, individuals have to meet eligibility criteria, uh, complete an initial application, and complete ongoing applications uh, and requirements to receive those benefits. So when thinking about the presence of these application costs, uh, economic theory provides ambiguous predictions in that these costs could either uh, could potentially improve targeting efficiency uh, if they lead individuals with a high opportunity cost of time to not pursue these programs. Uh, other evidence suggests that these application costs could actually worsen targeting efficiency because it might be the poorest individuals that have difficulties navigating uh, this system. So this leads to the potential for inequality in unemployment insurance eligibility, receipt, and take up. And that inequality can come from a lot of different dimensions, uh, from individuals' earnings, because those shape uh, UI eligibility. It can depend on where individuals live, because states have a lot of leeway over the administration of these programs. Uh, and also, there could be important roles for individuals' information or their expectations about UI benefits, as well as discrimination that they might face when interacting with the UI system. So this leads us to ask whether or not black and white individuals benefit equally from UI in the United States. Next slide, please. So what we're gonna do in this paper is to estimate UI receipt and take up for black and white individuals. Uh, when I say take up, I mean the receipt of UI among individuals that we think are likely to be eligible for the program. So that's the key distinction between receipt and take up is whether we condition on those that are likely eligible for the program. What we're gonna do here is to combine state level unemployment insurance regulations uh, that we've taken from Department of Labor documentation. Uh, and we'll combine that with individual level data on UI receipt, 
work history and demographic uh, from almost 30 years of SIP panels. Beyond just estimating these overall black-white gaps by receipt and take up, we'll then decompose these gaps into the explained and unexplained components uh, using an approach from Jonah Gelbach's 2016 Jolly paper. Uh, could you advance, please? And so the main results here are, are that, first of all, reported UI receipt is meaningfully lower among Black individuals in our sample. And that racial gap in UI receipt seems to be driven by the take up of benefits, not by eligibility. We estimate that approximately 80% of that gap is about take up, not eligible. We also find uh, quite interestingly that the racial gaps in UI receipt are quite stable over an almost 30 year period, which is gonna help us think about the potential role for measurement error or other mechanisms. And, and then and finally, we do see that observed variables can account in a statistical sense for a sizable amount of these UI gaps, with the two most important factors being, first of all, black individuals tend to have lower amounts of earnings before they lose their job, and they are more likely to live in the South. And both of those things, having lower earnings and living in the South, uh, are predictive of lower unemployment insurance receipt. And so that's a, a really important factor in that decomposition. Next slide, please. The key contribution of this paper is providing new evidence on racial differences in UI receipt and take up. I think the three things I would highlight that are most novel is that we estimate racial UI gaps over an almost 30 year period. Uh, we're able to look at the separate roles of eligibility and take up, and we estimate decompositions that help us think about the potential importance of individual and state level variables. Uh, at the same time, there's been a lot of really great work on unemployment insurance. And so we see our work as complementing uh, that literature. Some of the, the most well-known papers in this space have focused on UI take up, uh, but they do not focus specifically on race. So we're gonna bring that particular focus on race. Uh, and then there are kind of a, a relatively a large and growing number of papers that are estimating racial gaps of UI, UI receipt oftentimes using single years of survey data or sometimes using administrative data uh, that comes with its own measurement challenges uh, and opportunities. And so we think we're especially complementary uh, to that literature. More, more broadly, this paper is going to relate to uh, questions about why individuals take up safety net programs, uh, and that's received a lot of attention uh, throughout the social sciences literature. Okay, next slide, please. So the, the first thing that I wanna do is just describe uh, how we go about estimating racial differences in UI receipt and take up uh, in the next slide. What I need to do first is just provide a really quick overview of the UI system. Uh, so states in the United States ha have a lot of control over UI policies and administration in that states can shape eligibility requirements the amount and the duration of benefits, uh, as well as you know, a bunch of procedural and administrative decisions that shape individuals' interaction with the UI program. Uh, at, at a broad level, UI eligibility depends on why individuals separate from their job with, uh, if you're laid off, uh, you generally will qualify for UI. If you're quit, you may not qualify for UI, or you may just qualify for lower amounts of benefits. Beyond the reason for job, job separation, uh, UI eligibility depends on having a sufficient work history in a base period, which is typically some kind of five quarter period before individuals lose their job. And what a sufficient history is, uh, is measured both in terms of earnings and in terms of hours worked, depending on the state. So once an individual is eligible, uh, the weekly benefit amount that they receive will depend on their work history, uh, as well as the number of children that they have in some states with statutory minimums and maximums governing the benefit amount as well. Now, that weekly amount of benefits is certainly important, but, but also important is the duration of UI benefits. And, and that can really vary a lot across states uh, because of basically policy decisions that states make as well as unemployment rates and the presence of emergency programs, uh, as we saw, for example, during the Great Recession or during the, the COVID pandemic. And so what we're going to do is to take all of these state regulations that we've codified uh, and we'll construct for each individual 
their eligibility, their potential weekly benefit amount, and their potential duration of UI benefits in weeks. Uh, next slide. Now, we're able to do this by using uh, some really rich individual level data from the SIP. So we're using panels between 1986 and 2014. Uh, just as a reminder, you know, those interviews generally occur every four months and they have separate questions about each month. And so we really hope that that granularity of measurement is, is gonna help us capture both job transitions and UI uh, benefit receipt. And we're gonna construct a sample uh, that contains individuals who separated from their job in month 16 onwards from being in a SIP panel. Uh, and the reason that we need to do that is because we have to measure a base period earnings for each person. And again, that generally extends about five quarters before the period when individuals lost their job. So that's how we're gonna measure people's work history. We're gonna use the first four quarters of the five quarters before the job separation, uh, which is basically the, the kind of standard um, base period that's used in UI systems. But that gives us information on individuals before they separate from their job. And then we're going to use the panel structure of the SIP to follow individuals for 12 months after they separate from their job. And we're just gonna measure whether or not they receive UI benefits in that 12 month period and the amount of benefits that they receive. Uh, we'll exclude up if UI receipt is imputed because previous work has shown that uh, those benefit imputations uh, can be an important source of measurement. Next slide. So I just wanna kind of briefly uh, some main models that we are going to estimate. One of the things that we're really gonna be interested in today is the unconditional black-white gap in UI receipt. So that's just the difference in average receipt among white individuals and average receipt among black individuals. For what I'm about to discuss, it's convenient to think about that in a regression framework here. And that's what's shown in equation one, where Y is some outcome variable, like whether or not individuals receive UI in a 12 month period after they separate from their job, and B is an indicator for whether an individual is black. Our, all of our samples are gonna contain only black and white uh, non-Hispanic individuals. So in equation one, that parameter theta u is the unconditional black-white gap. Uh, now we know that black and white individuals differ on a lot of uh, observed and unobserved uh, dimensions. And so we're also interested in estimating equation two, which gives us the conditional black-white gap. So you can see that superscript on the theta parameter just changed from a U to a C, but in equation two, we're now controlling for a vector of observed variables X. And so that's going to allow us to think about the potential importance of observed variables in driving uh, the difference between the unconditional and the conditional black-white gap. And in particular, we're relying on this very nice decomposition from Gelbach where we can, uh, if you look at equation three, you can see the explained gap, which is the difference between the unconditional and the conditional gap. It turns out that that can be written uh, just as a linear function of two things. Uh, first of all, that first parameter is a gamma. And so that is the black white gap in one of the observed variables that we include in X. So that could be the black white gap in average income, for example. Uh, and, and then the other element in this decomposition is that parameter beta from equation two, which describes the relationship uh, between that observed variable and UI receipt. So basically for a variable to contribute to this uh, explained gap, that variable has to differ between black and white individuals, and it has to be related to UI receipt. Now, one thing I wanna stress is that we are not taking a stand that two is the right measure of the gap. I, I think the unconditional and the conditional gaps are both of interest, just depends on the question uh, that you're asking. The other thing I wanna underscore is that we're only identifying descriptive relationships here and that we don't think of these as capturing you know, the causal effect of race uh, or, or really anything else for that matter. So this is just about uh, a descriptive exercise. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so let, let's get into the results. Um, if you could advance, please. The, the first thing that I'm gonna show you here is when we pool all years of the SIP from 1986 to 2014, uh, and we calculate the share of individuals that receive UI benefits, any amount of UI benefits in the 12 months after they separate from a job. 
So the two bars on the left here uh, are looking at all individuals. And what you can see is that 37% of white individuals experience a job separation, uh, report receiving UI benefits in that 12 month period. The number is only 28% for black individuals. So that, that's almost a 24% gap between white and black individuals in the rate of receipt of UI benefits. But I think a natural question is how much of that is driven about differences in eligibility. Uh, one way that we can get at that is by focusing on individuals that we think are likely eligible for UI. Uh, and we can calculate that in the SIP using the labor market history information that we have. So the two bars on the right here uh, are we focus on individuals that we estimate uh, are likely to be eligible. And there you can see that the receipt of UI goes up. I don't think that's very surprising, but, but what's important is that this gap uh, between black and white individuals remains. And, and that in, when we look at people that are likely eligible, black individuals are almost 13 percentage points less likely to receive UI. So that continues to be a sizable gap. Uh, next slide, please. Now we also measure the amount of UI benefits that are received in the SIP. Uh, and here, I just wanna underscore that those gaps uh, continue to exist when we look at the dollar amount of benefits received, and, and those are quite sizable. Uh, next slide, please. Now what we're, I'm doing here is kind of going back to looking at all individuals and asking what share of job separators uh, report receiving UI benefits. Uh, we're doing this by kind of pooling the SIP data into five-year bins to smooth out fluctuations from kind of changes in the data uh, or scenes and, and stuff like that. And so what you can see is that basically for most of these years, uh, there's a, a similarly sized racial gap in UI receipt. Really, the, the only exception is the years in the late 1980s. That also happens to be the period where we have basically the, the worst ability uh, to distinguish between imputed UI benefits or not. So we personally place less weight uh, on those estimates in the late 80s. And, and otherwise from this, we see kind of pretty stable gaps uh, in racial gaps in UI receipt over time. I think that's important because previous work has shown that measurement error has increased over time. Uh, and then of course there was also the SIP redesign uh, in 1996. So when you're thinking about potential kind of survey-based explanations for this gap, uh, the stability of this, uh, at least to us, uh, points against those survey-based explanations, but I'm going to have more to say about that at the end. Um, next slide, please. So here, uh, this is, um, if you could go back, please. Thank you. Um, so, so this is just repeating the same figure, but then looking at individuals that we estimate uh, to be eligible for UI benefits. Uh, and so here you see basically a, a persistent take-up gap as well. So this isn't just about risk, but we also see that with take up. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so, uh, you know, I, I think take up is perhaps the easy thing to think about um, because it strips out potential differences in eligibility. And so I just want to briefly discuss what might drive those differences in take up. In general, we think that individuals are making decisions about whether or not to pursue benefits. It's in part going to depend on the value of those benefits to an individual, and, and that could differ by race. So the, the benefit value will depend on the weekly benefit amount, the potential duration of benefits. And we can also think about basically how much people need the money. Um, and so those are the things that are going to shape the value of benefits. Uh, on the cost side, we want to think in particular about both the time and the psychic cost that arise from uh, applying for UI. And of course, stigma might play an important role here as well. The final thing I think to mention is that, you know, information and perceptions about benefits and costs are really what drive this decision. And so uh, we think that we're in an environment where a lot of individuals have imperfect information about the UI system. Previous work has shown, for example, that, that a large number of individuals don't apply for UI because they don't think that they are eligible. Next slide, please. So, so we can look at some summary statistics from the SIP to help adjudicate among those potential explanations uh, for why take up might differ among black and white individuals. And, and what I'll just highlight here is that on a lot of dimensions, uh, we see evidence that, that suggests to us that black individuals will place the same value on UI benefits, if not a higher value. And so for example, black individuals in our sample are less likely to be married. They have 
more children, fewer years of education, lower amounts of wages. All, all of those are things that I think would point towards placing a higher value on the benefit of UI receipt, uh, conditional on losing a job. That's also underscored uh, by the fact that the replacement rate for black individuals is higher. So on average, UI is replacing a larger share of black individuals income. Uh, and in part, that's just because black individuals have lower amounts of wages. And there's kind of a redistributive function that maps from base period wages into the replacement rate. The, the final thing I'll underscore on this slide is that black individuals are as likely to live in the South than white individuals, 60% versus almost 30%. And, and that's important because because states have a lot of leeway in determining UI program rules. Uh, and, you know, I think there's uh, a widespread belief in it and just kind of basic facts that states in the South tend to provide less generous benefits here. Okay, next slide, please. So, so the final set of results that I wanna show you are, are decomposition results uh, for whether or not individuals get UI in 12 months after separating from their job. So the three rows that I'm reporting for you here are the unconditional gap, where we don't include any observed variables in that regression, uh, the conditional gap, where we do include observed variables, and then th the difference between the two. And I'll just focus on the two left columns for all individuals here, where we see that, for example, observed variables can explain about 81% of the receipt gap. So, so that's an important contribution. And if, it, if you'd advance the slides, please, we can, thank you, uh, we, we can decompose uh, this explained gap into all of the underlying variables. So there's a lot of numbers here, but I'll just summarize them for you. The, the two things that really matter uh, is earnings and work history and the region where individuals live. So base period wages explain almost half of the unconditional gap. And the South explains about 22% of that unconditional gap. So, so those are really important. In contrast, things like uh, the number of kids that people have, their marital status, state unemployment rates, uh, other policy rules that aren't related to UI, a lot of those other things don't really matter here. It's about how much money people earn before they lose their job and the region where they live. Uh, in the next slide, please. So I, I think like the, the biggest open question here is how much of these results uh, are driven by measurement error? You know, we take very seriously this literature, which has shown that surveys measure transfer receipt uh, with substantial error. Uh, when we look at these results, we see some factors that point against measurement error as the primary source of the racial UI gap in that we're including folks that have imputed UI benefits. We're looking over a 12 month after individuals separate from their job uh, and also these racial UI gaps are stable over time. Uh, uh, so that gives us, I think, some hope that, that these are real differences we're identifying. At the same time, we really would like to do more here. I, I think the gold standard, which is uh, hopefully will be possible soon, is to link administrative UI records to survey data and then to re-estimate these models. But I'll just flag that any and all ideas here are, are especially welcome. And then if you could bring us to the conclusion, please. Uh, and the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so uh, just really quickly, this paper shows that black individuals are less likely to report the receipt of unemployment insurance benefits than white individuals uh, in the SIP data. I don't think I have time to walk through all of these, but I'll just say that the gaps that we estimate are economically meaningful. And, and so I think thinking about the, the, the kind of reliability of the results and then what to do about them uh, is important for thinking about racial differences in economic opportunities and economic resources. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right, I'm going to turn it over now to, excuse me, to Dr. Jake Sabina of the Education and Social Stratification Branch to discuss the second presentation on race, ethnicity, and the receipt of charitable aid. Yeah, so, you know, quick introduction. I'm Jake Sabina. I'm at the, in the Education and Social Stratification Branch. Um, as Veronica said, We'll be discussing the second paper, Race, Ethnicity, and the Receipt of Charitable Aid. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, please. So I think sort of the, the two big questions that I kind of took, took away from this paper were, first of all, do we see this, this allocation of charitable aid going to the least wealthy nationally? 
right? So this is probably the group that we we might expect would need it most. Um, and then second of all, you know, a question below that then is, you know, do racial and ethnic biases play a role in this allocation, this pattern of allocation? And I think these two questions, you know, they, they're obviously seem very important just on their face. Um, Han Zhang does a, does a good job in the paper of kind of um, building up a little bit more. I think, you know, you, you can frame this sort of as we've had a lot of policy choices that have kind of offloaded it from sort of this charitable giving from a sort of public sphere to, sphere to a private market. Um, and that there's, you know, some evidence in the literature that this, this potentially doesn't um, allocate in, uh, you know, the way we might think is optimal to the least wealthy. And, you know, there are many potential barriers um, to, to why this might be the case, but, you know, one that kind of jumps out is, you know, are, are there racial and ethnic biases, um, you know, at play here? So, he, he goes about trying to answer these two questions um, in sort of three parts in this paper. First, starting with sort of uh, an overhead view of, you know, do we see disparities across wealth and across race and ethnicity in the receipt of charitable aid? And then we can kind of change gears in the middle here and, and zoom in to really look at um, a set of controlled experiments that, that tried to see, you know, in, in, in these controlled settings, do, do we see some biases pop up um, in charitable giving, depending on the race and ethnicity of the recipient? And then lastly, we zoom back out to this big picture to try to see, you know, do, do we, are, are there other demographics that might explain some of the disparities that we see? So next slide, please. And so I think um, touching on here, what I think this paper does particularly well um, is I think that it's a really creative use of the SIP. Um, I think that, you know, I was not familiar with these questions we had in the SIP about, um, you know, charitable uh, receipt of charitable aid. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure how much attention those get, but, but it's really neat to see a pairing of those questions with some of the rich demographic data we have in the SIP, um, as well as the wealth data, um, and see a project focusing on that. So, I, you know, I think this is a really nice paper, um, a really cool idea you have going on here. Um, I think that um, just some things that I, you know, personally appreciated are, are there's a lot of information, um, you, know, you know, you're trying to show all at once and and you've got some charts that really make it easy for someone, um, you, you know, to interpret that all at once. And I also thought this this sort of meta analysis of these experiments was well thought through. Um, you know, getting all this replication data um, and sort of trying to squeeze out all of the, you know, information that we can really gather through them. Um, it's a well thought through analysis. Um, you know, down to even just little adjustments for inflation across the years to make sure the wealth groups are the same between these experiments and was really well done. Um, so I think my big takeaways from this paper, going back to those two questions I highlighted, one, I think that what you are showing is we do sort of see that the probability of receiving charitable aid is higher, dirt, you know, down at, at sort of the lower end of the distribution of wealth. Um, and I think we are seeing then, you know, you, you do show that there is some disparity along racial and ethnic group lines in the receipt of charitable aid. Um, but I think that it's it's just, it's particularly start down at the lower end of the distribution. There, there's, you know, there's significant differences in the probability of receiving charitable aid um, between white recipients, black recipients, Hispanic recipients. Um, and that's sort of the, 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 again, the area of the distribution that we might think is, is, is the one where this aid, you know, should be efficiently distributed to. I think the, the takeaway from the controlled experiments is that, you know, in this, in this controlled setting, we're not necessarily seeing these biases pop up. 
I think that these, you know, there's some important context to those experiments. Like I think in, in one or two of those experiments, the recipients were sort of particularly, um, you know, victims of Katrina and that, you know, it, it is questionable whether these are really applicable at a national level then um, or, or more generalizable, but, but it was, it is really neat to see, you know, sort of a zoomed in uh, how this is playing out, you know, at, at a very micro level. And then I think this last section, looking at immigration, language spoken at home, citizenship, um, what really stood out to me is that, you know, there are some differences among immigration status uh, for black and white recipients. Um, and it wasn't actually too surprising. I think, I think we do see a bias toward non-immigrants in the receipt of charitable aid. And that, you know, this dynamic we saw with black recipients where, you know, black immigrants are wealthier and less likely to receive aid sort of makes sense in a t context of, of where these immigrants may be immigrating from. Uh, next slide, please. So I think then some suggestions moving forward with this. Um, I think that it may be worthwhile to explore some of the other demographics that, the, that you know, SIP has um, at play here. Um, you know, I understand the reasonings for looking at language spoken at home and citizenship to see sort of this cultural um, kind of mismatch going on and how that impacts the receipt of charitable aid. Um, I think there are some other things that may prove worthwhile, like family size, number of children, and because I'm part of the education branch, um, I have to say educational attainment. But I do think that that'll, you know, that could be something that interacts with immigration in an interesting way and sort of isolates, um, you know, uh, some differences between immigrant groups. I think that an another interesting thing to look at would be, you know, you've got these different categories of charitable aid um, and seeing how those differ. You might be able to group it. I, I know sample size became an issue, but you might be able to group them um, in ways to see how they differ along the wealth distribution. Um, and I think just one small thing is, is, you know, maybe provide some more direct comparisons in your figures between disparities in wealth receipt and charity receipt. And then finally, in that last part, part three, um, it, it may help to sort of focus this part a little bit more on some of the significant differences you're seeing, um, particularly at sort of the lower end of the asset distribution. Um, rather than looking at sort of a continuous distribution, it, it may be worthwhile to sort of um, create, create, you know, sort of discrete groups there and that might provide, you know, a, a more clear look at, at what's going on. Um, but so, you know, in summary, I thought it was a great paper um, and great presentation. So thanks. Thank you, Jake. I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Mike King from the Program Participation and Income Transfers Branch. We'll be discussing the first and third paper. Thanks, Veronica. To begin, I just really wanted to say first that um, these papers were a pleasure to read, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to hear the authors talk a little bit more about them and to provide my own thoughts on, on each of them. Um, but before I get to each paper, I wanna just say a couple of things I think applies to all of them. Um, and the first is that it's really exciting, someone who works on SIP a lot, it's really exciting to see some of the work use the most recently available SIP data. Um, we, it seems like folks who are using SIP often shy away from using um, data after the 2014 redesign. And so it's refreshing to see all three papers in this session and so many others during the conference really embracing the more recent data and answering some really interesting questions with that. The second thing I'll say, and this echoes something we heard during the keynote yesterday, was it's nice to see, particularly in these two papers that I'm talking about, some really interesting, important descriptive work, right? We're not relying on these strong identification strategies. We just have some really interesting questions that are unanswered, and we can answer them with descriptive work. So that's nice to see as well. And then the third thing that I would commend these papers for doing is working with the sheer amount data that they are and compiling a lot of different pieces together, whether that's over time or across SIP. 
there's a huge amount of information available in the SIP. And when you layer on all these additional years, it, it it's a lot. I sometimes don't even like combining a couple years of it. And so I really give the amount, the amount of effort that goes into combining as much data as these papers do. So I'll begin more specific comments with the paper that Gwen presented on social safety net distribution. You know, this paper is really um, a presentation of the distribution of social safety net benefits in total um, across a number of programs, uh, looking at that across different family structures and across the income distribution. And we see this as a continuation of prior work that has tried to do this with more updated information, bringing in Medicaid, bringing in more recent years of data. And we see basically a continuation in this trend of support, um, less support going to those who are the most disadvantaged, um, you know, that lowest group in the income distribution they were looking at, and uh, a shift towards some more support going to um, slightly less disadvantaged groups. Uh, and this is particularly prevalent among those with children. So this is an important finding on its own, but what the paper then does is try to say, well, where is some of this coming from? How is this playing out in each of the different programs we're looking at and how has this changed over time? And so, you know, the, these shifts that have occurred can occur in a lot of different places for different programs. They're occurring in countervailing directions for different groups. And so we see this long-term decline in cash assistance through TANF balanced out kind of in total with expansions in EITC or the CTC, expansions in SNAP, but with all of these different pieces, they're really ending up targeting different groups. So some groups are losing some of the benefits, some are gaining some of the benefits. And what we end up with is a, a, a noticeable shift in the distribution um, of where these benefits are ending up, sometimes by design through the design of the programs and sometimes not necessarily. And so some of the things that I think are most exciting about this paper, or at least caught my attention the most, is one that I already mentioned, right? The large amount of data being used here. And so we have, I think, 11 different programs across a, about 20 years worth of data, which is impressive on its own. We're drawing in an additional data set to add uh, information about Medicaid to the mix, see how that factors in, because it is a huge component of the social safety net. We're even drawing in information from TaxSim to figure out what EITC and CTC look like that might not be available in the base SIP. And so just purely, again, it's an endeavor to bring this much information together. And I, I appreciate the effort that has gone into that. The second thing that really caught my attention is the, um, the work to further impute underreported program receipts in SIP in a way to bring it up to match administrative aggregate records both at the receipt level and at the amount level. And under certain conditions, I think that this kind of approach might concern me. And when I first saw it, I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's, uh, that's interesting how this is happening. But I think with this focus of this paper, the relatively narrow focus, the descriptive focus, looking at just family structure and income, that this is a really useful approach for people to think about when looking at SIP and a way to deal with this kind of persistent underreporting of social safety net programs that we observe in, so, uh, in sample surveys. And so I'm interested a lot in how this was done and some of the comments I'll say later, we'll touch on this, but um, it's certainly on my mind as I'm you know, responsible in some capacity for many of these programs to think about how we could use similar strategies for um, any internal research and thinking about what our data uh, tell us. So that said, I wanted to wrap up here with some questions and thoughts about future work, things that I had thought about while reading it, um, things that I wanted to know a little bit more information about perhaps. The first of these is the assumptions and some of the details that go into the imputation in particular. And just to highlight a few things that I was thinking about doing this, one of them, one of them that I had questions about was the analysis is at the family level, the entire analysis is at the family level, and so the imputation is occurring at the family level as well. And so just a little bit of information about what that means for individual level benefits, how we're matching those to aggregate totals that might be at an individual level instead of a family or household level, and um, how those may or may not align with administrative records that are totals that we're looking at. And in a similar vein with the imputation, I'm curious about geographic 
differences in imputation that might be missed by imputing to aggregate national numbers. And so my understanding is that region is included in the models that we're using in the imputation here, but we know that many of these programs are administered quite differently across different states. Uh, the eligibility rules are different. The generosity of the programs is different. And so I'm just wondering if there's anything that we're missing um, in some of these findings that might be masked um, by not getting that, that state level detail, which is difficult, admittedly. And so the another data thing that I was interested in hearing a little bit more about was the decision to limit each panel to only four months. And I suspect this is partially out of ease, and I've already praised you for combining a lot of data together. So I, I feel a little bit bad by being like, oh, you should use even more of the data that's that's there. But I wonder if there's any expectation that this choice to only focus on four months of each year might mask something. And one possibility would be to check a couple years using the full data to see what do the results look like if we have the full data, how does it compare to our kind of extrapolation from four months just to um, answer some of those concerns that people might have. And the final thing I'll say about this paper, and I know that this was alluded to um, as a future direction, but I think many people looking at this and thinking about this kind of distribution of benefits, the thing on people's mind is the pandemic. And so I am really looking forward to additional work that um, incorporates what we saw during the pandemic, kind of comparing it to what we saw during the recession. How did um, the distribution change? Where was the uh, support targeted, right? We know that some support offered during the pandemic, like the stimulus checks, were ending up being more universally distributed among this population. Some was more likely to end up going to people with higher incomes, like the SNAP emergency allotments, which really brought higher SNAP amounts to people with higher incomes and did very little to people with lower incomes. Um, and at the same time, we saw some support going directly to people with children, either through the advanced child tax credit or um, pandemic EBT to replace school meals. And so just thinking about what anticipating what happened during the pandemic and i'm you know just really looking forward to seeing what those results look like once they are available moving on to the second paper that brian presented on um, the racial gap in unemployment receipt and take up this is a really fascinating descriptive accounting of the differences in in these um, rates and the additional layer of what we can point to that's available in the data in order to understand this gap a little bit better. Um, we have, you know, a, a relatively important, if unfortunately perhaps unsurprising finding that black adults are much less likely to both receive UI benefits in general and receive it among those who we think are eligible. Um, in fact, much of the difference in receipt is due to that difference in take up, they show. And this finding that this is remarkably stable over time. And so both of those things I think are, are, are great starting points on their own, but then to go the additional step of decomposing these gaps to understand what, what is kind of at play here, at least descriptively available in the data. Um, and as he highlighted in the presentation, the two that they, they kind of settle on as being some of the most important are those pre-unemployment earnings, the difference in pre-unemployment earnings between the two groups, as well as the likelihood to, to reside in the South. So in terms of you know, the things that I, I was kind of most impressed about in this paper, again, the sheer amount of data being used here, 30 years of SIP data, um, that's a lot. And within each panel, we're talking about a lot of information being used to even answer the question. It's a very data intensive question they're looking at. And the SIP is well, suited to answer this question, but it really does require a lot of information. And so in that vein, I think there's actually this really interesting use of the UI calculator that they're doing behind the scenes that wasn't necessarily talked about as much, but as the person at Census and working on SIP who's now responsible for the UI content, this is certainly something that's interesting to me and I'm super curious about it and would love to know if this is something that is uh, readily available for others to use as well. Um, I think, you know, that that kind of relying on as much data as we can instead of to get some of this information is is a direction that I'm certainly interested in. The questions or additional thoughts I had going forward, I'll kind of um, break down into two pieces. 
two or more data related questions, two or more substantive questions. The first that came to my mind thinking about the share amount of data that you have, you have to have to do this analysis um, is about differential attrition in the panel. And so I understand the need for the data and that um, the sample needed to be restricted in the way it was. Um, but I wonder what that means for the people who have already left the sample by the time we're allowing somebody to be eligible to enter. So those 16 months is a long time, but each panel has uh, you know, noticeable attrition and that's increased over time. And so I would just be curious if there's any descriptive work to look at the people who might be um, losing a job before that 16 month period, what their reports are on unemployment. I know you can use the calculator in the same way, but just getting a sense of who these people are and whether or not we should be concerned about any sort of attrition that's happening. The second piece uh, about data is that I really appreciated the engagement with measurement error, um, both in the paper and in the presentation. We know, as with the previous paper, we know we're underreporting. We can try to do whatever we can to resolve this. But one of the things I've been thinking about with this paper is whether, um, so you, you omit imputed receipt entirely, and I think that may help some of the problem. But even if the imputation and SIP were perfect and everybody was getting the correct value for whether they got UI or not when we were imputing them, um, there's still a lot of people who did receive UI and are not telling us about it. And this is true about a lot of programs. And so I'm just wondering if there's differential misreporting um, among these groups and whether that may factor in in any important way. I know that the stability in the gap on some credency that the measurement error might not be that that dramatic, but just thinking about um, are there additional pieces here to think about and, and to look at. Even um, a basic thought experiment of how much measurement error between the two groups would be necessary to help explain some of this uh, might be useful in, in terms of a discussion. The two substantive comments I'll end with in terms of some of the, the framing of the paper and the discussion um, are first about administrative burden. And so I think when I first read this, as we increasingly are talking about administrative burden in academics, policymakers are increasingly interested in it. It was the place that my mind immediately went when I was thinking about, well, why aren't people taking out um, UI receipt if they're eligible? And the analysis does include some measures of the administrative hurdles faced in each state. But I do wonder if those measures are really capturing everything that may be at play here, including perceived burden and particularly racialized burden that's going on here. And so we there's some interesting recent work on layering on this kind of racialized component to the administrative burden literature. Um, and I think that there may be something there to either include up front as we're theorizing about some of these things or in the end of the discussion about what might what might be at play here and whether there's anything being missed in the measures that are included along that line. And then the final thing I'll end with is um, a push for a little bit more contextualization of the highly racialized and historic differences in pre-unemployment earnings. And so, you know, it's flagged as the one of the, well, the most important um, expl uh, explanatory piece of the gap that we see among the observed things. Um, and it's net of a lot of things, but I think more could be said or explored in that discussion, thinking about those differences in pre-unemployment earnings, why those differences exist and what that means um, from a historical context, from a, um, an inequality context, and, and just helping the uh, readers understand what what some of that result is from. And I think there's a, some good work in the paper that nods to this more when talking about how the South, the residents in the South is important in explaining the gap. Um, so certainly around issues affecting trust in the government and the legacy of Jim Crow. And I think that maybe just both of those areas could be expanded a bit more when we're thinking about how this racial gap should be contextualized and thought about in terms of racial inequality more broadly. Um, I'll, I'll end with one final comment, and you already nodded to this as well in the presentation. It would be interesting to see how this plays out in the pandemic as well, right? As soon as we have the data available to know that massive increase in unemployment receipt um, during the pandemic, did that close gaps, did it widen it? 
and why, you know, what can we point to to understand um, what happened there and how does that broaden our understanding of these racial inequality um, considerations more broadly. So I'll end it there and I think we'll open it up to questions. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank our panelists for contributing their papers, our discussions for their comments. Does anyone in the audience have any questions? I think I see something in the chat uh, from Vivian Chen. I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, thank you for sharing these three studies with us. As your focus on the trend and gap in the program receipt, have you done any work or plan to do any analysis of program Im impact over time, given the SIP panel nature? If so, could you talk about what socioeconomic outcomes you would consider? For example, do you consider any measures of financial relief? Are those measures available from SIP? And any limitation of using SIP for this type of impact study? Um, hi, this is Gwen. Um, I can maybe comment on just a few of those, but um, right now, Carolina and Robert and I are working on a project using the SIP panel, um, using the panel structure of the data, um, specifically looking at the more recent years. Um, though it, the outcomes will be very similar to what we've shown. Um, I do think there are questions about, I'm, I mean, financial relief, I guess, is kind of broad, but there are some questions about, um, like, we're more interested in SNAP receipt, and there are questions about whether or not you received uh, donate, like, food donations from, from charities or churches, if that is maybe what you're asking about. So I think that's available, um, although other people might be able to speak more broadly about that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? You can enter them in the chat or raise your hand. Brock, I have a quick question. Uh, hopefully quick. Um, it's for the, I think, the second presentation for Han Zhang. Um, you mentioned that you had some difficulty in working through how you might use the weights. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Because I think addressing the sample design and getting the weights into your analysis correctly would be a big enhancement. Yeah. Um, it's. Uh, it's really the, the weight issue is really with a particular model. Um, so, like for for most of the graphs I presented, um, like it was um, basically like like for for all but one of the graphs, uh, the the error um, uh, the standard standard error should be correct. Um, it's just that one graph where I have the um, um, asset to poverty ratio on the x axis um and um uh probability of charity receipt on the y axis it's just that one graph uh where the um uh the error bars might not be correct um because i was using um uh, the uh, the general additive model 
um, in that graph. Uh, and um, the way uh, the, the R package I used it just does not really work that well with um, sampling weight. Um, and uh, it, it also cannot handle uh, replicate weights. Um, so um, that's why um, I, I said the, the error bars in that one is not correct. Um, so in the future, I might consider uh, using some simpler models like splines uh, or something like that uh, to, uh, to get the right um, standard errors. Okay. All right, that makes a little bit more sense. I was I was worried that what you were implying was that you then didn't use weights at all, and then uh, because I, there's there's lots of reasons to use them. Um, getting at a minimum the, the the base weights and the I mean the 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 um, regular second stage weights with that adjust for the sampling design is really important. Getting the replicate weights in will is also a big add, but if the software you're working with is making that difficult for you, at a minimum using the regular weights. You're and since you're also pooling across panels, doing the weighting within each of the panels, but then dividing appropriately so that you're not over representing the the count. Um, that you're trying to represent. So, yeah, I I think I did that. Um, so hope, so I think the the estimate is uh, the um, the the best estimate I can get is just the uh, the standard error in that particular graph that is right. inaccurate. Um, Down the road, if you you need to talk to folks about weights, we have uh, a lot of folks here who who use them a lot and. Uh, created them and are very good with them. So, yeah, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Jason. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Okay, well, I'd like to thank our panelists and our discussants one last time for a wonderful session. Uh, I really learned a lot. It was wonderful to see the SIP used in so many different ways. Uh, this was a really wonderful discussion of both, I think, the formal and informal social safety net, which is something that the SIP is able to really combine and feature. Uh, and I know from other SIP analysts and, of course, myself, well, we're really proud that SIP has that kind of breadth and depth uh, on this important topic. Thank you so much. Please have a great rest of your day.